Hi, my name's uh, Anurag Gupta. I run the Analytics Aurora and uh, RDS services for AWS. Uh, so th this is going to be an interesting talk. Uh, I um, was initially asked to do something about how the future is now, and uh, you know I told them they had the wrong guy, but and I could instead maybe do a talk on you know technology trends in data processing. And uh, so I'll pick a couple of a uh, handful of things and just talk about things we're observing as you know, inside the AWS data processing community and uh, how those are impacting what we build. You'll have seen some of those announcements earlier today. I'll actually, if I've learned one thing over my six years at uh, doing these uh, events at reInvent, it's that not everybody wakes up in time for the keynote. And uh, so I'll um, try to do a little bit of repetition so that you catch up. I'll actually try to go pretty fast through the slide deck and take questions because I know there's a lot of new content that Andy threw at you and you know, part of what maybe we can do together is just try to figure out how you might be able to use some of the new things that are coming up. Uh, so let's start with the um, three trends I'll talk about today. One is just about the growing explosion of data. Uh, the third is sort of the move towards serverless API-centric computing. And uh, the, sorry, the second is that, and the third one is about how, you know, really across the board, more and more of us are uh, dealing with a global uh, footprint of uh, users who all want local access, right? And those are, I think, non-controversial uh, statements. So first, uh, I, I guess, you know, it was really about two years ago that I first started hearing uh, uh, you know, about the term uh, data lakes as a term of art in a lot of uh, customer conversations. But it's caught on really quickly. And uh, I'd say that if I'm in 100 uh, executive briefing center conversations, probably 98 of them bring up data lakes. And, you know, so it's really uh, got, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's hot right now, I guess. Uh, so the question is why? And I guess I'd say that, um, you know, traditionally, if you started doing data warehousing back in the day when I did, you know, it was actually pretty simple. You had your SAP database, you had your Oracle data warehouse, and you had a pipe that moved data one, from one to the other, maybe once a week or if you were really cool, once you know, a night. And uh, <clears> that worked pretty well, right? Uh, I mean, it had its issues, but uh, uh, you know, it worked pretty well. It continues to work really well. So what's causing people to look at a change nowadays? And I think the big trend here is, is that the majority of data is machine generated now. And you know, I remember back in the day, you know, people used to talk about data on voice networks, and then pretty soon we started talking about voice on data networks. And it's kind of the same thing, right? It's kind of like the internet is actually a video streaming platform nowadays, and all the rest of what we do on the internet is just a small fraction, right? And so, you know, and that's kind of becoming true with machine-generated data completely overwhelming the rest of the, you know, typical business analytics that people used to do. So why? The f first reason is, is that there are a lot more devices Right? You know, we all carry mobile phones. Uh, we all have, you know, my doorknob at my hotel has a chip in it that lets me get in. Right? It's uh, across the board, you look around and there are just devices everywhere. Um, Rahul Pata, who works in my team, uh, mentioned recently that apparently one third of uh, mobile signups recently were for cars. So that's kind of interesting, right? Everything is generating data. Uh, so s separate that away. And then I think the other thing that's interesting is that increasingly analytics isn't an after the fact activity. So as someone who carries a pager inside AWS, you know, I need to know what's going on when, some, you know, when my pager goes. And you know, that's really something about data that is collected across you know, thousands, maybe millions of nodes uh, arriving in some place where I can look at it in the dashboard and understand uh, you know, where the anomaly has occurred that caused my pager to go off and how to go and roll back something or whatever I'm going to do. And so, you know, real time used to be a unusual case uh, for, you know, the once in a while case. And it was sort of the beginning of the morning dashboards that, you know, people used to care about. But now the consequence of machine generated data is actually the need to react on it quickly, whether it's uh, 
um, automatically or it's um, you know through human intervention. And then the third thing is is that I, you know a lot of what we talk about in AWS is the need to for innovation, the need to improve velocity, and you know that's uh, you know inventing things, and you know that's why a lot of you are here. It's a lot of what you guys do. And you know that part of that is the DevOps culture and the move towards you know really empowering developers. And I think, but one of the things that that's also a consequence of that is you know the increase in the rate of change of data. I mean, a lot of us have de you know dealt with the fact that our pipe you know our analytics pipeline broke because some guy changed a JSON file, right? Um, so you know that really has uh, moved towards data lakes, not instead of data warehouses, but in addition to data warehouses. And you know, it sort of extends relational data to non-relational data. You know, we have uh, customers running at exabyte scale, you know, and uh, which is unusual. But one of the things I've observed is, uh, and you can sort of take this back almost uh, 30 years, which is that data grows 10x every five years. So if you've got a petabyte of data, 15 years from now, you'll have an exabyte of data. If you have a gigabyte of data, you know, 15, that's kind of sad, but you know, 15 years from now, you'll have a terabyte of data, right? Um, and you know, one of the things that's also consequential from this is, is that you know, your schema is going to, is, needs to get defined on analysis. You can't really do something where um, <clears throat> you have people sit there and, you know, like, and a group of IT data architects who are going to decide the limits to which analysis can be performed anymore, right? And then one of the advantages of moving to a data lake uh, is, is that you can start running a variety of tools against it, right? It's not about putting data just in one place and using that one tool. There's a huge you know, variety of data processing engines, and there are, they exist because they're good at something. And you know, they've all founded their niches and you know, for most of us, we use uh, not just a relational database, we use Hadoop, not just Hadoop, but we use machine learning, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, you've all heard the term about um, data has gravity, right? And it feels kind of meaningless uh, you know, in the same sense that the future is now. But um, I think you know, what we mean by that and you know, why it sort of um, makes sense is, is that it's hard to change once you have a lot of data, right? And so as you start throwing data into a lake, and you know, one of the things you want is a system that can really process, you know, ingest quickly, right? And, but then the next thing you want is, is for your data to be in an open data format. A lot of people talk about, you know, separating compute from storage and so on, and you know, it makes sense. The, um, but then they talk about using a private format. And that's just not gonna play, right? Because that means that everything you're gonna analyze on that data has to be in that format. So if you're using um, a data lake, I would strongly advise you to use something like CSV or JSON or Parquet or ORC if you're interested in compression and performance and so forth, which most of us are. Um, so let's look at you know, the AWS picture and what we've been working on over this period. So you know, we pretty strongly believe that uh, S3 is a good place to you know, build your data lake. Uh, you know, really, S3 is your data warehouse in this world. Uh, you know, there are a lot of ways to get data in. You have the combination of low cost and um, you know, very high scale and very high durability, which is unusual. There are people who provide low cost. There are people who provide high durability. There are people who provide uh, uh, you know, high scalability, you don't usually get three out of three on those. And, you know, we've been working really hard on uh, the security compliance audit capabilities around that. And it's really important, you know, if you believe that data has gravity, that you be able to run analytics on that data without movement. So let's assume you've gone and put your data into S3 or, you know, your uh, data storage system of source. The next thing you want to do, in a sort of, a, and you can think of it as a, a pyramid, I guess, or concentric circles, is that you need to understand what you've got, right? And so a pile of data isn't worth anything. So that's about really being able to discover it, crawling, cataloging, indexing, and securing, right? And now that you've got data that you can understand, the next thing you want to do is actually use it, which is to say analyze it, right? 
And then sort of the you know, capstone of that pyramid is really to be able to do more advanced analytics like inference and so forth, machine learning, et cetera. And you know, we have been working on you know, developing that uh, sequence of capabilities. Let's go through some of those. So data cataloging is really important. So we have um, a capability called AWS Glues Data Catalog. And you know, which will go and automatically discover your data sources, store the schema. It's a Hive compatible meta store. The data is searchable. It's, you can use it for ETL. You can use it for inside a lot of our data sources. Um, <clears throat> and it's serverless, uh, which uh, you'll see me uh, you know, come to many times. And I think one of the important things about uh, having a data catalog is, is that it's incredibly important that you have automatic uh, generation of schemata or uh, evolution of schemata. Because um, if you want to do this one at a time and so forth, it's, uh, it gets really challenging, right? I, uh, I was talking to a financial services company recently, and um, they used to have, um, I think it was 10 people uh, 15 years ago that were responsible for going and looking at their various data and categorizing it and all of the rest of it. And uh, they needed to do that for compliance reasons. 15 years later, they have 10,000 people. If that continues to follow the rule of thumb I gave you before, you know, 15 years from now, they'll have 10 million people, which you know, will be great for the economy but, you know, <laughs> and unemployment, but you know, it really just doesn't make sense, right? This stuff is automatable. And um, so what we do when we crawl your data is, is you can provide your own custom classifiers and we have a bunch of built-in classifiers uh, you know, for JSON, Parquet, CSV, et cetera. So we'll you know, enumerate your S3 objects, we'll go through and figure out, oh wait, this file has these fields, this file has those fields, et cetera, and we'll go and generate schema. And the reason we have to do that is, is that not all, of our t not all of the tools out there operate schema on read, right? So, uh, we have to be able to you know, generate a schema that works for them and evolve it, right? Because as you get new files and so forth. Um, and you can add your own classifiers if you wish. You know, Grok is supported, for example. Um, it's also important that you be, we be able to detect partitions. One of the standard things that people do is to try to look for, what we'll do is estimate the schema similarity between files and uh, try to understand which columns to add, and then also look at the um, uh, bucket hierarchy to see, how, because there's also eff effectively column information in there. It's very common for people to say, I'll have a bucket that's the month name, and then a bucket, a sub-bucket that's the date, and then uh, a bunch of files underneath that. And you would lose information if you didn't have the month and date into your table, right? So that's crawling. Let's take a quick look at the next layer of the stack around uh, data warehousing and so forth. So, you know, I introduced Redshift uh, at uh, this conference six years ago. And, you know, Redshift's a columnar data warehouse. It scales out. It's a, it'll read a bunch of the open data formats. Uh, we focus a lot on security. And, you know, it's pretty inexpensive. And you can scale from a few hundred gigabytes up to, uh, you know, tens of petabytes, uh, and that's actual customers. Um, so Amazon EMR gives you big data processing. You know, EMR was sort of the original sort of data lake before data lakes were cool. So it's always run against uh, S3 as, you know, we're using uh, S3 file system underneath HDFS. So we support eight, 19 open source projects, and, you know, our focus here is really to support the Apache projects really as quickly as possible after they launch, but um, you know, then try to innovate with respect to how to provide cost improvements by allowing ephemeral uh, clusters that are right-sized for the particular job, using spot for those instances, auto-scaling those clusters, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, there's, a, there's still a big, big space for you know, both standard SQL data warehousing and standard Hadoop and Spark process in, this, in you know, analytics. Um, Elasticsearch is exploding, right? I mean, and whether that's Amazon's Elasticsearch service or just core, the core Elk stack around uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, and uh, Logstash. 
And you know, that's just because it makes it really easy uh, you know, to just search for a keyword and find all of the different places that might have it. And you know, search is a, just a fundamental operation um, in uh, analytics. And you know, so this is one of the ways that we provide it. Um, Kinesis is our stack that provides uh, streaming analytics, uh, you know, just the basics of moving data in, moving data specifically into S3 or Redshift, analyzing that data in process, and you, and we saw, you saw announced today video streams. Um, another very important part of the stack. And um, let's talk about graph. So I remember um, many years ago now, I guess, um, you know, it was the same year that uh, Google uh, wrote the uh, Pregel paper and the MapReduce paper. And back then, I really thought that uh, Graph was going to be as big or bigger than uh, MapReduce. And, you know, and that just hasn't pay played out just yet. And, but I think, interestingly, what's interesting to me is, is that uh, a lot of the applications people are building today are graph applications, whether they know it or not. I mean, most of them are built on relational databases, but there are a lot of people in this room who are doing attribution. There are a lot of people who are trying to understand uh, the correlation between events. There are a lot of people who are trying to just understand, you know, some of the uh, consequential axes. If you like this, you know, you would like this, et cetera. We, a lot of us are doing it in relational databases, but the fact is, is that graphs actually make that a far more fluid experience. Um, um, you know, if you think about this, uh, well, let me not uh, go into too much detail here. Uh, so, you know, you can build them with existing graph databases. You can build it with a relational database. I personally find, you know, however much I use relational databases all the time, they're pretty unnatural for doing graphs. What you end up doing is uh, one of two things. You actually, you either represent the relationships as attributes, you're basically flipping it over into a triple store, or you um, do a ton of joins, you know, join after join after join to go from one table to the next. And they don't really work well for uh, changing a uh, schema. And if you look at the existing graph databases that people have moved to, they've just been, I think, more focused on the expressibility of graphs themselves than uh, the, just the fundamentals of the database. It's sort of the graph databases you see backed by relational databases, you know, focus on database, and the graph databases you see that are custom built, focus on the word graph, and kind of forget the fact that you still have data and you need to make it, you know, available, secure, reliable, robust, all of that stuff. Um, so Neptune we announced earlier today. Um, one important thing about Neptune is, is that we support both Tinkerpop and RDF which are the two big, uh, you know, popular models uh, using Gremlin or Sparkle, respectively. And I think that's important because, uh, you know, you, know you, you can see that we strongly don't, you know, believe that one size does not fit all and that there are a lot of reasons for people to have uh, the ability to run a property graph or the ability to be able to traverse relationships. Um, and, uh, you know, it scales. It'll scale out to, uh, Certainly hundreds of billions. I haven't personally tried over a trillion records, but that would be a big graph. I mean, even if you think about you know, Facebook's graph, there are only a few 10, you know, less than 10 billion people in the world, and you know, not all of them are using Facebook, right? So that's already a huge graph, but uh, I think um, it's important that you be able to you know, traverse these graphs um, with you know, the sort of latency you expect in an OLTP system. And it has the you know, similar re redundancy and reliability as Aurora, six replicas of your data, um, you know, three AZs, full backup and restore happening in the background to S3. Um, so I'll wait for questions on that afterwards. Let's talk about serverless API-centric computing. So I think uh, when you think about serverless, there are a bunch of reasons people are going to serverless. One is that um, it's just painful managing servers. And um, I'd say that if I look at a typical startup 10 years ago and a typical startup today, um, 10 years ago you might have had uh, 10 back-end developers for every front-end developer. And nowadays you see 10 front-end developers for every back-end developers. 
And I think, uh, or you know, full stack developers. Um, and I think uh, places like AWS are part of the reason why we take care of what we think of as undifferentiated heavy lifting. Uh, we try to do a really good job on that because, you know, if we're backing up a million instances every night, we probably get pretty good at it, right? And we probably see more uh, issues that might arise at relatively low frequency than the typical DBA. <clears throat> I would say that that also generalizes to an almost an API economy, right? Where it's not, once you're writing an app and you're calling an API inside a microservice, it doesn't really matter who you're getting it from. Right, as long as they are secure and available and all the rest of those, you know, illities, if you will. And so, you know, it's as reasonable to go and do a put into S3 as it is to make a payment call into Stripe, right? And the fact that, you know, they're not both, at, you know, AWS maybe doesn't matter so much. And so I think, you know, there's almost a pretty big move in that area. And uh, you can see that a lot of people, not just within AWS, are supporting services. I think that's especially important in the mobile app community where it real, you know, you can access each of these things regardless of where they are, uh, roughly equivalently. So if you look at that with the, in the context of analytics, it really is useful to get rid of all of the infrastructure and administration. Um, dealing, you know, you're increasingly dealing with scale you don't really want to manage scale. And part of the issue with scale is provisioning to peak, right? You don't want to provision to peak. You want to provision to the activity you have going on and so forth. So this is a picture of a uh, serverless um, analytics thing where you're going into S3. S3 is intrinsically serverless, right? It's got a get and a put. You don't ever think about, you know, if you want to put uh, your, uh, you know, photos in there, it'll work just fine, and it'll cost not very much. You're, if you're Pinterest and you want to put photos in there, it'll still work, right? And it's actually the same API stack. Um, you can start, you know, query that with Athena, you can, uh, and then you can query Athena using QuickSight, right? So let's dig in a little bit. So we have a variety of serverless options. Uh, let's think about why. So I think the core thing about Athena is to provide a really simple interface. So you've got your data in, you can just go and walk up to the Athena console and query it. And, uh, and that I think helps for the occasional users. So for example, you know, AWS has a data uh, warehouse, you know, it's been up for about 10 years, it's got a lot of data in it. Uh, my product managers query it every day. I might query it once a month if my uh, manager asks me, like, oh, why is, uh, you know, this, uh, why is this anomalous thing happening in, uh, you know, the growth rate for Athena or whatever? And, um, you know, I don't really want to use, uh, nor does anyone want to provision me as a user inside their standard data warehousing environment. But I know SQL. It's very easy for me to just spin up uh, an Athena query and go run it. And it looks very much like all of the standard JDBC, ODBC, Presto, and so forth that I know well. And it'll scale, right? Um, if you look at Spectrum, Spectrum is really about power. So one of the, you know, so when I was managing, you know, both Redshift and EMR, it was just really interesting to see how uh, Redshift, uh, you know, as a, has a commercial grade optimizer, it'll optimize the storage formats, it'll run really fast, and so forth. But you know, there's overhead there. If you look at something like EMR, it scales out beautifully, just on a per job basis. So the question is, how do you get both of those things, right? How do you get the benefits of commercial grade optimization on massive data sets on a per query basis? And Spectrum's really how we are doing that. You can store your data in Redshift for local access. You can store your data in S3 as part of your data lake. And you can, ex um, I demoed at uh, the San Francisco summit a query with four joins uh, over an exabyte of uh, data um, and you know, some group buys and all the rest of the complexity. Uh, returning uh, in about three minutes, I believe. And so, and that's impressive. I mean, I have not seen numbers, you know, even two orders of magnitude close to that in the past. And that's pretty cool because you're also able to store your data in the same single data format inside S3, right? And you don't have to deal with the ingestion, you don't have to deal with anything. You can also run, um, 
you know, your Hadoop jobs against it, if you would prefer to run some other thing that understands you know, CSV or Parquet, go for it, right? It works just fine. And it's on a per query basis, so if you're running a massive query, you know, it scales out and you're paying just for the resources you consume. If you're running a little query, it, you know, it just uses the resources you need there. So you know, I think that flexibility is really important as you start to deal with big data because you can't have everything run against Every, you know, you, even if you have big data, you still have some, a mix of small queries and large queries, simple queries and complex ones. So let's shift over to Aurora Serverless, which was announced earlier today. So when we look at, um, so when we announced um, Aurora a few years ago at this conference, um, I got basically three asks from people. One was for multi-master, one was for Postgres support, and one was, gosh, this is, you know, I really wish this thing ran, you know, on the uh, T1 micro at the time. Gosh, you know, putting a really high-end enterprise-grade database on a T1 micro, I mean, it's, it's challenging, right? Um, but that isn't really what they wanted. What they want, you know, as I dug into it, what they wanted was dev test systems. They wanted to be able to support systems that ran not just their always on, you know, high end databases, but, you know, the mass of their databases. And then, you know, as we've been talking to people over the years, you know, they also say, oh, it's, you know, it's reasonable for me to move my um, fancy new game to Aurora but actually it's actually somewhat difficult for me to figure out what the scalability point of that should be. And I don't really want to move my older you know, game catalog on it. But shoot, you know, sometimes you know, like, there's a movie reference to Frogger and suddenly it gets hot and, uh, you know, for a week or two. And um, that's, uh, you know, it's also challenging, right? So there are a lot of reasons to have it being, uh, have a, a serverless option. Now, you, the normal way that you do serverless is to do a paper request model. Now, a paper request model is actually challenging in the OLTP database, a transactional database. And the reason for that is, is that um, you have to extend from the guy who's trying to do a microblogging site where he's just getting you know, uh, maybe five requests an hour and then it's off until he does his next post or versus somebody who's trying to support uh, you know, a high-end game. And so with Aurora Serverless, we want to support you know, the full instance family in Aurora, T2 small to um, R416 Excel. But what we're, the other problem with a request-based model is, is that you're, you have a lot of requests on these systems. You know, we talk about Aurora being able to do 200,000 writes per second using the Suspense benchmark. Now, you don't really want to, pay per request on that, right? Uh, you want to pay for the instance that's used. And part of why the instance is efficient is, is because there's a database cache and there is locality of reference. So what we built here is some, a system that starts up on demand, shuts down when not in use. It automatically scales as you have excess, uh, as you find that uh, you need more CPU or memory and you know, scales down when you don't. We have request routers in each of three AZs. You have a database endpoint that's just an IP address. You put that endpoint into your uh, JDBC or ODBC uh, reference, and, uh, but we'll route appropriately to the instances and start them up on demand. And you know, pay per second, one minute minimum. And underneath the covers, there's a warm pool of instances. So the first request will uh, provision the database instance. And there is a little bit of uh, jitter there, right? It'll take you know, five, maybe five seconds, maybe 10 seconds. We're working to bring that down. Um, but um, you know, depending on your app, maybe that'll be suitable. Certainly for a dev test kind of workload, it makes sense. If I'm running a CICD pipeline, uh, it might make sense for me to be able to run against my full data set, but uh, have it just spin up an instance when it needs to and then shut it down. Um, will uh, scale an instance in about one to three seconds. Now that actually is going to be relatively invisible to you uh, because what we do there is, is that um, we will take the time to bring in the new instance and then we'll do the cutover once with the instance is there. And <clears throat> so you know, it really is relatively invisible. And you know, what we do is, is that in the routing layer, we maintain your session state. And so, 
you, know, you can basically, as long as there aren't any active requests in progress, we can transition them over. Um, instances hibernate after a user defines period of activity. So what that means is, is that you basically, in Aurora Serverless, you define the minimum instance size you want, the maximum instance size you want, and when to shut it down, like after five minutes of inactivity. And um, so, of course, the database storage itself does not go away, right? It's sitting inside Aurora Storage, and uh, it'll, you know, you'll pay for it, you know, whether the database is up or not, because we're paying for it, you know, whether the database is up or not. And you can, of course, delete the volume whenever you want. Um, let's uh, shift over to um, the problem of global users, local processing. So, you know, when I dug in, uh, when we announced Aurora about, oh, people really wanted multi-master. And so, so what do you want in multi-master? And they really wanted multi-region multi-master. And that's interesting, right? Uh, because, um, you know, you normally, you know, think of that as one of those, you know, high-end financial tech company writing, you know, billions of lines of code every year. Um, you know, not really most of us, but, you know, the problem is, is that even if I'm building, you know, a game, a mobile game, I have, um, I might have users all around the world, and they all want the same local access as someone on the east coast of the United States would want if I happen to be running in US East 1. And, uh, you know, then there's also the fact that, you know, I mean, it's a mobile game, which means that, you know, people move around and, you know, someone might, you know, I can't just trivially shard the data because, into regions because, you know, people travel and they may still want access and they want that access to be fast when they travel. You know, it's totally reasonable. So, you know, we announced today uh, Global Tables, which is multi-master, multi-region. And, um, you know, people like uh, Cassandra have offered uh, a global t uh, table capability for, you know, some time. It wasn't really in a managed way. I think it was really important for us to support something that had all of the good things about uh, DynamoDB, which are the seamless scalability, the ability to provision additional IOPS against it, uh, the uh, ability to run, uh, you know, billions of transactions per second if you need to, um, and, uh, you know, just something that kind of just works. Um, so um, I think that uh, we're really excited about this. Hopefully you are as well. Um, uh, shifting to Aurora for a second, because uh, we also announced that uh, earlier today. Um, it's actually a harder problem in the um, relational database world, because I think one of the things that the NoSQL world is able to do is it's able to restrict capabilities, right? It says, it'll say something like, okay, it's a single request operation that is rerunnable, or it doesn't have the transaction semantics. If it has transaction semantics, transactions have to be limited in size, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you might do range partitioning. You might be limited to an individual range, when, you know, in terms of any individual transaction. There are lots, there's, a, you know, a host of things that, you know, you find in these systems that, help them scale, help them perform, help them provide consistency, but make it somewhat difficult for you know, those of us who are moving from a relational world to uh, run that uh, sort of environment. So let's talk a little bit about how people have attacked multi-master in the relational database community over the last couple of decades. So, I mean, the standard model in um, uh, databases, for example, like Rack, is, is that uh, you, know, you have a shared disk cluster. So you write your application that writes to either of two SQL endpoints. You know, the transaction layer is the same, the logging is the same, the storage is the same. And what you're basically doing is fusing the cache. And so what's cool about that is all of the data is available to all of the node. It makes the apps easy to build. And it's actually very similar intrinsically to the model that you might be familiar in, in how uh, multi-socket, multi-processors work, where what they do is, is that, you know, you, all of the processors can access the RAM, and what you need to make sure of is, is that the caches across, are, you know, only one guy has the, uh, effectively a write lock, and, you know, if multiple people access it, it degrades to a read, and so on. Um, the challenges with, uh, you know, systems that do this are really the same challenges 
you may be familiar with in the applications you write against a multi-socket system, which is the cache coherency is expensive, right? And uh, in this particular case, you're running it on a per lock basis. So if it happens to be that the lock is local, great. If it happens to be that the lock is remote, it's challenging. Uh, in this particular case, uh, networking can also be pretty expensive. Oracle, for, expense, for example, really recommends InfiniBand, and you know, that, require, that brings along uh, some uh, you know, expense in also the people who understand those sorts of protocols. Um, and you can actually get negative scaling when you have hot blocks. And that's very similar, again, to what you have with uh, cache lines in a multiprocessor, that you know, the cache pings back and forth. And lastly, I, I didn't put this on the slide, it also limits how far you can scale. So for example, many of us may have found that uh, you know, running on a two-socket multiprocessor actually isn't that bad because half of your writes or reads happen to be local, and then the other half take uh, a hit uh, where, you know, similar to the read from memory of you know, 200 uh, microseconds, or 200 clock cycles, pardon me. And um, the, um, but uh, if you go to a four-way processor, 75% um, of your uh, reads and writes are probably hitting that penalty. So that's a different thing, you know, same application, but suddenly you're in the world of really having to think about your cache lines. And that's a very similar problem to uh, the sort of DLM-based uh, models and uh, processing, so that as you scale it out, it becomes more challenging. So the Alternative here has really been uh, shared nothing architectures, which you know we're basically it's effectively sharding underneath the covers at the SQL layer. The you send the query, it gets broken up and sent to a variety of data nodes. Um, there's a far less coherence traffic here. It really shifts it from a per lock basis to a per commit basis, and therefore it scales out better. Um, and so you know the cons on the side is is that. The commit protocols are heavyweight, you know, and uh, you tend to have to do range partitioning because uh, you kind of want to be able to isolate which uh, in nodes you talk to when you're running the commit protocol. So if I know that I've touched these three ranges, I can talk to just those three nodes as part of my commit. Whereas if I were talking to all 500 uh, things because I was hash partitioning instead, it would be more challenging, right? And in general, what you find across the board on these systems is cross partition operations are expensive. And so they really guide you towards uh, small requests. So in some sense, they're, they may be relation, they consider themselves relational systems. They're really no SQL systems because they have most of the same constraints. So uh, what we're building in um, Aurora is something that's kind of different from either of those things, which um, different for sure, hopefully better. Um, and so what we're doing is uh, conflict resolution using ledgers. So the observation that we've made is, is that, you know, there are multiple oases of consistency. So any given um, database node knows exactly what the write sequence it needs to have honored for, or the read sequence between the transactions at that node. And any given storage node knows the uh, partial ordering that must be, you know, that it uh, saw when it uh, performed a write. And so, you know, and what were applied. And so the only time that you have conflict is not when you have a lock, which would be very pessimistic, right? And saying that I don't know whether somebody else might be doing something, so therefore I'm gonna lock it down. Or not when you have a commit, which is I don't know if somebody else may have touched something, let me go and make sure no one else has. Uh, but only when there's actually a conflict. And it's not, and the conflicts have to be between both multiple database nodes and multiple storage nodes, right? Because if you only have an individual storage node, um, uh, you know, that has been written by multiple people, which happens, for example, with hot blocks, right? Um, uh, sequence numbers. And uh, so, you know, those can be resolved locally, and that's pretty cool, right? So the hottest locks can be handled um, in, within an individual storage node and ordered. Um, but um, 
So when you have both, then you have to go to some place to figure out who has to pay the, you know, the piper and get uh, canceled out. It's optimistic concurrency control. And you, know, you can call that a ledger. Um, you know, it's basically what ledgers do underneath the covers. Um, finally, there's a lot of overlap between ledgers and um, redo logs. And you know, we know a fair bit about logging in the database community. But in the basic point here is, is that there's less coordination, which means less network traffic, which means it scales out better, and uh, so forth. The, so why am I talking about this in the context of um, global databases? And that's basically because once you have a ledger system, you can make conflict resolution hierarchical. So for example, what you can do is say um, that uh, you have um, you know, a conflict resolved at an individual storage node, or a conflict resolved at a regional master, or a conflict resolved across regions. And so basically what, what the operations each of them will see is, you know, as you go up that tree, it's, uh, you know, it's whatever was not processable below that. And so as long as you live in the world where most of the regional activity is happening within the region, you'll be fine. And so, you know, Still a lot of work to be done on this, uh, but um, we are pretty optimistic about the approach. And what this page is basically showing is, is that um, you know, the blue master is writing uh, page one followed by page two, the orange master is writing page two followed by page one. And you know, on a quorum of six, um, the, uh, the first page was you know, taken by the uh, um, the blue guy the, on the second one, the orange guy got the second page, they're writing in different orders. One of those two has to be failed. But it's detectable, right? It can't be detected in any individual note, but this is a case where the same set of data was being modified by both a multitude of storage nodes and a multitude of uh, database nodes that would have escalated to a regional uh, ledger and within that your database and uh, been, been resolved. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. This is really a cache, crash recovery in multi-master. If you want to understand how crash recovery works in multi-master, you can attend my deep dive later in the day. Um, so multi-region, you know, is partly the hierarchical um, um, stuff. The other thing that what we do is, is that we basically partition your database, similar to what I was describing people uh, you know, would do in uh, the uh, shared nothing kind of architectures, where you would basically define, here's a local partition, and that local partition is remote in the other region, and the local partition in the remote region uh, is local over, I'm uh, sorry, is remote over here. And so, um, and what we're doing that's novel there is, is that if you're familiar with how physical um, replication works in Aurora, we're able to get to you know, circa 10 millisecond uh, replication lag because we're re what we push are redo logs. And you know, redo logs have a couple of major advantages. One is, is that you can pretty much, you can guarantee that if I started with this block and I applied these set of log changes, if I got these changes here, I will get those changes there. And I cannot make that same claim with bin logs, and, uh, which is challenging, right? And um, so what we're doing is we're applying that redo log based physical replication also across regions. And what that does is that it roughly takes the, uh, the lag to what the physical lag is across the uh, network across regions, which, you know, even in the worst case is in, on the order of single digit seconds. So we're optimistic also that that's going to really uh, change the game in terms of what the penalties people have to pay for global databases, uh, global relational databases. So with that, um, I'm happy to take some questions. I think I've got uh, about 15 minutes left. If anyone has any questions? I'm sorry? Uh, the question was, when's my deep dive session? I am um, ashamed to say I don't know. Let me, uh, sometime today, and also on Friday, let me tell you. Um, it is um, a little bit, it is at 4.45 p.m.
Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was, can you describe the difference between serverless and multi-tenancy? So I would, um, so the big difference is, is that um, serverless is not multi-tenant. And I think um, when you're operating on data, if you're you know, paranoid about security as we are in AWS, you really do not want to co-mingle data, right? If you, you know, if you have data on a, a a shared box, you really want separated encryption keys and things of that nature. And, you know, and we do all of those sorts of things. It um, becomes challenging when you have um, a surface area as wide, as wide as a database to ensure that, uh, particularly when you share code with open source, that you can avoid zero day attacks, right? And so it's, and it, from our perspective, it's absolutely critical that someone who somehow, you know, finds a way to exit the database image can't uh, then attack the other resources on their box. So from our perspective, it, uh, you know, in general, we tend to prefer um, running uh, boxes inside VMs because you know, we, there's a, a high level of trust that's been built up over a long time in that uh, technology stack. You know, I mean, obviously containers are super popular, but um, you know, they have, um, it's largely based on you know, Linux networking uh, constraints in terms of what's accessible. And um, it's a little harder to say what uh, is, happens there. So you know, in general, when, if we dirty an instance, we'll return it to EC2 to wipe and then bring back, which is why we run warm pools. Does that make sense? I'm sorry? So the question was, is there a migration path to multi-master? So you, uh, the underlying question is, are the data formats the same? And uh, the data formats are indeed different, you're correct. Um, and we will do an automatic migration upgrade from single master to multi-master. And the reason the, migration, uh, the formats are different is, is that uh, the transaction IDs have to uh, contain the, um, yeah, the master node ID. Right, and a variety of other small things, um, uh, you know, fuzzing of time, all of that stuff. I'm sorry, could you repeat? So the question was, well, what about the case where I have uh, multiple databases? Once I have multi-master, how do I converge it? And um, you know, it's good feedback. I think I'll take that back to the team. I think you know, across the board, we've had uh, interest from people on how to converge database, you know, MySQL databases together or Postgres databases together when they run Aurora because they have more headroom there and they don't want to run as large a fleet. And so I think uh, that totally makes sense. Um, let me just uh, make a note in my head, and I'll give you a card if you want to send me an email, just to, and you know, follow up in the conversation. Okay. Okay. Does, the, does the multi-master write conflict result in a deadlock that returns to the client? The question was, does a multi-master write conflict return, uh, result in a deadlock that uh, goes back to the client? Uh, the answer is uh, no. What it does is it's very similar to a lock deadlock on the single master, where even there what you do is you pick a victim, and uh, that victim gets rolled back and restarted as a request. And uh, it's really only the case where you, know, you just fail a few times that you have to return back to the user, because the user doesn't necessarily want to incur penalty beyond a particular threshold. So it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's really a... In that sense, it's this funny combination between um, a distributed lock manager and the techniques you do in lock management around deadlock detection and the techniques you do in, uh, for example, Paxos around doing distributed coordination. But uh, in this particular part of it, it's uh, very similar. You, know, you shouldn't have to rewrite your app for this, other than the you know, traditional things that you just always have to do in these systems. 
to be able to avoid heat being overly high on individual things. We hope that that's going to be much less, but you know, we're still building. Uh, are we talking, uh, so the question was, is the database size fixed or can it be changed in auto scaling? Are you talking about uh, Aurora Serverless in this case? Yeah. Okay, so the question was in, uh, in the context of the Aurora Serverless. So the whole point of Aurora Serverless is to be able to do transparent scaling, right? And so you pick the minimum instance size, which right now in Aurora is a T2 small, and you pick the maximum instance size, which right now is an R416 Excel. You can pick anything you want. You can say like, I just want an R4 large as the minimum and the maximum. In that case, I'm not gonna scale it, right? I'm just, you, well, the only reason to pick it in that case is to say, oh, I want it to automatically shut down based on period of inactivity. But you can also do something else. And, and the reason you might wanna do something other than full bottom to top is, is that you know that you're running an application that is, when it's up, it's actually got some weight to it, like for example, uh, the HR compensation application that we run inside AWS. You know, most of the year it just has some HR people on it, and then four times a year or twice a year it has every single manager inside uh, Amazon inside of it, right? And then, so we either you you know in the current world you either end up in the world where you're browning it out or you're provisioning to peak, right? or a combination of both. And uh, with serverless, it kind of handles that in a more graceful manner. Uh, but you, know, you might say, like, if it comes up, I really just wanted to have at least this much capacity. Right? Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was, are we planning on offering a serverless version of Spark, given all the benefits I just mentioned? Um, so uh, there's nothing we've decided upon at this time. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, Glue ETL is based on Spark, and um, it'll run uh, you know, pretty much standard Spark. I mean, where do you, we are using it for you know, doing uh, transformations, but it's, it's a code, right? You can put whatever you want in it and run it. And there are people who use it with development, uh, developer endpoints to just do effectively serverless Spark. Um, I would also say that you know, EMR has um, a pretty large ecosystem of Spark users within it. And um, I think part of what has been advantageous for EMR is, is that it really does let you pay per job with you know, all of the same uh, EC2 billing uh, that you get, you know, which is, you know, again, pay per second. And um, it has a lot of scaling built into it, you know, sort of out of the box as well. So, I think to the degree that your clusters in, um, you know, what you do is really move to uh, ephemeral clusters uh, and you know, pay, cluster per job and your data in S3. I think EMR is pseudo serverless. The problem is, is that there's still this notion of having to pick, uh, you know, instant size and all the rest of it. And you don't want to do that. And the spin-up time and the latency. So, you know, should we have a warm pool in the EMR? We should have a warm pool in the EMR, of course. And so, you know, again, you, I'll give you a card. You can, uh, you know, drop me a note. I'll pass it on to Rahul. Yes, sir. So the question was, uh, Kay, can I describe um, more about how uh, global transactions work in multi-region, multi-master? So the basic concept here is, is that every um, transaction ID now also has a, uh, a uh, in this case, a region ID and then the node ID within it, right? That's a logical node ID, right? And so because you want the transaction IDs to be generated without you know, like some consensus protocol as well. And so <clears throat> what you're doing at that point is that then at the storage node, you're just trying to decide which ones did I touch, who have I written, and you know, can I run my commit, right? And so when I run my commit, you basically are going and seeing whether you have conflicts at that time. Uh, but the storage node can tell you 
you know, whom you have to, um, uh, you know, run inside the ledger. Okay. And so the point here is, is basically if you see operations that have happened uh, with other nodes intra region, you just go to the regional ledger. If you see things that have happened with nodes outside the region, you have to go to a, reg you know, a master ledger you know, that's cross region, right? And uh, you know, that is the basic model. It's, uh, there isn't anything super complex about it. Yeah, as long as you record where, where your node is and what region it's from. You know, the rest of it is just uh, sort of coding. So the question was, how do I invalidate the cache in another region? So the cache semantics here have a lot to do with, uh, you know, the notions of time and fuzzing and understanding the you know, read after write consistency and making sure that inside your request session you know when you last performed a request and what you're allowed to read. And you know, MySQL has a lot of semantics around read view construction and there's an awful lot in that that I'm not gonna be able to get into. But yes, <laughs> those issues exist. I see. So the question was, um, so where does the ledger reside and what, what are you using for it? And you know, so almost uh, by definition, the only acceptable answer to that is the raw storage itself, right? So what you have to do is, is that, what we do is that we elect uh, an Uber master and we say, okay, this guy is who I route the requests to. I also maybe route my DDL statements to that person because I don't want to do consensus protocols for DDL. And then, um, you know, they run a ledger. And what is a ledger? The ledger is a table in Aurora storage. It has, you know, it's only written to by one person who has rights to it. And if somebody else wants to write it, they need to go through an election protocol, right? Correct. So the question was, doesn't Aurora storage only have cluster scope? But that's correct. But the ledger is also limited in scope to the uh, uh, the bounds of an individual cluster. How do you do it hierarchically? So each of those, uh, you know, so the cluster is in this model still uh, a set of nodes that whether they're inside uh, a single AZ or inside multiple AZs in a single region or multiple regions inside a single, um, uh, you know, I guess planet, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're still, um, you know, part of the same cluster, right? Because uh, that ownership has to exist just from a rights management of who is allowed to read this data and who's allowed to update this data, uh, right? Because underneath the covers, uh, Aurora storage is multi-tenant. So we have to run protocols to understand who's allowed to read any particular segment of data. So we do know who's allowed in, uh, in all cases, right? And then past that, it's just a question of electing a master, right? So if I understand this, so something is stored to AZ within a region part. So you try and build this ledger here. So unless you are replicating that thing to another AZ within the same region, then feeding that Uh huh. So the question was, unless you replicate the data, you know, aren't, don't you have an issue? But we do replicate all data, right? Uh, it's not just, I mean, the ledger isn't special the same way that the um, sys tables uh, table isn't special, right? That has to be replicated everywhere. And so uh, it's just a, it's an internal table used to provide consensus, you know, in much the same way as an undo segment header is an un internal data structure, right? It doesn't, it's not actually a table, but you know, you get the idea. Yeah. 